3D printers have never been more convenient or sophisticated. What's that? Don't believe me? Too much tinkering? Well, let me show you how things were 10 years ago. It seems to me like the right time to take a look back to the past, because last week we had a look at next gen 3D printers and what the future might bring. It's easy to forget just how far we've come, and these early solutions that you're about to see, although they seem archaic, were important steps in reaching where we are today. So let's rewind a decade. The year is 2012, and at my school I'm in charge of running a MakerBot Replicator 1. With its plywood construction, it looks like early RepRap machines, but it actually printed quite well. Wanting my own 3D printer for home, I purchased one of these, a Solidoodle 2, and I splashed out in spending an extra US 200 on the expert model. That got me this fancy enclosure and acrylic door, but otherwise it was a pretty basic machine by today's standards. I mean the base model didn't even have a heated bed. It didn't come with any type of interface on the printer either, so the first mod I did, and the first time I ever modified Marlin firmware, was adding this Panalolu display, as well as click knob controller. I was part of an amazing community on Soliforum, where users collaborated together to develop and document these mods for each other. Some of them were highly experimental and verging on crazy, and I've linked a video I made about that topic down in the description. But this video is about how the printer came stock, and we're going to start with the extruder and hot end combo. Back then, the popular RepRap option was the Wade's geared extruder, and I remember really fashionable remixes that changed the gear to this herringbone design. The Solidoodle 2, amazingly, had a direct drive extruder and an all metal hot end, but it wasn't anywhere near as good as it sounded. The extruder was nicknamed the Jigsaw because it was made of many laser cut acrylic pieces, which had to be assembled painstakingly in the correct order with careful attention not to break any of the delicate components. Once all of this was together, it bolted onto the front of a NEMA 17 stepper motor. The hot end was nichrome powered. What on earth is that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. This printer didn't come with a heater block. Back then, they were pretty rare, and even rarer still were heater cartridges. So therefore, the heating element was handmade with this stuff, nichrome wire. Think of it like filament for a light bulb. It's designed to get hot when electricity goes through it. The version I have here is just under 14 ohms resistance per meter. So with a length this short, the resistance is tiny, pretty much like a short circuit. So when I apply 12 volts with a suitable power supply, it does in fact act like a light bulb. Along with this wire, to build a hot end back then, you would need some hollow brass M6 rod. I don't have a lathe to drill out the center, so let's just pretend this one is hollow. Here's one of the original nozzles from my Solidoodle 2. As you can see, the thread is on the inside, and this orifice is 0.34, which seemed to be the fashion at the time. Our nozzle would screw onto the outside of the brass threaded rod. Our next component is a piece of plastic in the form of a groove mount. This was typically made of peak because it has such a high temperature for its melting point. Here, I'm just using PLA because peak is too expensive for this simple example. The reason this was peak was because there was no heatsink fan, and there was no heatsink fan because there was no heatsink. The temperature of the hot end was designed to just seep into the peak with a piece of plywood to stop the acrylic from heating up and melting. But let's get back to that heating element. It needs to be made by wrapping nichrome wire around our exposed threaded rod, and sealing all of that was this stuff, fireproof cement. And no, this is absolutely not a joke. To do this properly, you'd know the voltage of your power supply, have a target wattage for your heating element, and then measure out the right length of nichrome wire to achieve the resistance required for that wattage. For this demonstration, I'm just going to wing it with what seems like a convenient length. We start by building up a layer of fireproof cement around the thread, kind of like an insulating layer. And yes, this stuff is messy, but at least it washes off with water. After that, we leave one end of our wire hanging out because we need to add to it later on, and then we start to carefully wrap the rest of it around the threaded rod and fireproof cement. I'm sure there were people who got really good at this, but I'm definitely not one of them. Also keep in mind that somewhere in here, you would need to embed a thermistor. We take generous amounts of fireproof cement and try and build up a thick layer around the outside of everything. And when you've kind of got enough, you can fold down the loose end ready for termination. 
It has been 10 years, but I did forget that this stuff is almost impossible to solder, and it falls off as soon as you look at it the wrong way. So instead, we have to crimp, and I snipped off the end of a ferrule, inserted either end, and then crimped it shut, followed of course by some heat shrink to keep everything tidy. Following this, we would get some sort of fiberglass insulation, substituted here with paper towel, wrapping it around the still wet fireproof cement, helping it to form a much nicer shape. The final layer to keep everything tidy on the solidoodle was some sort of heat proof wrap, but here I'm simply using heat shrink. Clean off the excess cement and you've got a decade old recipe for a hot end. The instructions say to leave the cement to dry for 48 hours, but I was impatient so I left it overnight in a food dehydrator. So finally it was time to test this abomination by connecting it to a 12 volt power supply. It's a little bit warmer than ambient, having just come out of the dehydrator, but as soon as we apply power, it should be quite obvious. No PID algorithm here, just raw voltage being applied to the wire, and it doesn't take long until we reach 100 degrees Celsius, and then we start to have some steam coming out, probably from bits of cement that hadn't quite dried. For some reason, my thermal camera was topping out at 150 degrees C. So I introduced a strand of PLA, and sure enough, the nozzle was hot enough to melt it. As you might expect, it was also hot enough to melt my fake peak groove mount. This is a crude version of a crude process, but I hope it gets the point across. I remember having to do this at least once when the factory hot end failed. So trying to emulate the J-head, which was highly regarded at the time, I ended up building my own twin resistor heat block system, repurposing the factory solidoodle peak mount. So that's how the plastic came out, but how about where it was deposited? We're now turning our attention to the heated bed, and remember mine is heated because I don't have the base model. These days were spoiled with heated PCBs, and we can see the trace going back and forth, providing even heat throughout the bed, and we have an embedded thermistor too. Nothing like that for the Solidoodle 2, there was a 3mm aluminium plate with a power resistor strapped to the middle. Back then, magnetic spring steel sheets just did not exist. The best option was glass, and the worst option was what the Solidoodle had. And that was a layer of polyemi tape, better known as Captain Tape. This stuff is still quite easy to buy. It's worth having around because it can withstand temperatures up to 250 degrees Celsius without melting. Back then, it was used throughout the printer to tidy things up and also as a substitute for electrical tape. If I'm going to recreate this Captain Tape bed coating, I need a guinea pig printer and the Ender 3 is going to be it, simply because I have a spare magnetic sheet to put back on afterwards. However, the old magnetic sheet was not going to come off easily and it took me about 20 minutes to peel it off bit by bit until it got to the point where it was empty and I could clean it ready to apply the tape. Back in the day, I bought this really wide roll so I could apply a tape to the whole bed in one go. But these days, it seems to be past its best, and it will not peel off without tearing. So we're doing an old school version of old school, where we use narrower strips and build them up across the surface of the bed. Not only are you fighting the usual battle against bubbles being introduced, but now we have to try and align the tape as best as we can against the edge of the adjacent piece. This is as far as I got before I ran out of patience. I remember being bad at this back in the day, and I don't think I've gotten any better. My overlaps are poor and I've got too many bubbles. But it's good enough to proceed, so let's send a 3D print. This printer has the convenience of a BL touch, which means despite the change, I should still have a good first layer. I also have the advantage of compensating for the warped bed with auto bed leveling. Thanks to these modern advancements, the first layer goes down quite well. And Captain Tape is actually quite good as a 3D printer bed surface in terms of sticking to different materials. It offers plenty of grip, and like glass or PEI, it can be enhanced with a fine mist of hairspray. Fine wisps can be peeled off with your fingernail, just like on a PEI sheet. And if the model's contact patch is small, you might be able to get a good enough hold on your object to wrestle it straight off without any tools. The problems are introduced once we start printing larger objects. As before, the first layer goes down perfectly well, but this print is not coming off just by pulling it with your fingers, so we need to use our friend the scraper. Unlike PEI and glass, Captain doesn't self-release as it cools down, so quite a bit of force is needed. This means we have inevitable safety hazards, and the Captain tape tears very easily and lifts up in other places. And with each new print comes additional damage. 
and I remember constantly having to replace sections of captain tape or trying to position my models in the slicer on a different part of the bed to avoid the areas with existing damage. Unsurprisingly, I switched to a silicon bed heater and then designed this elaborate system that would clamp down a pane of glass over the top. So we've covered old school hardware, but what was the software like? If we revisit the Solidoodle 2 product page, we can see that the software is open source and available for Windows, Mac and Linux. So let's follow the link through for how to install software. We have an Arduino driver and then we need to manually install Python. And then after that, we get to the two main items, Pronterface, which I still use from time to time, and Scheme Forge, which was one of the two most popular slices at the time. We can still find GitHub repositories for Skyn Forge available to this day, but downloading it is quite hard. The developer's site that is meant to have it has stopped functioning for a long time now, but thanks to great free websites like the Internet Archive, which I've used extensively in making this video, we can enter the website address that we're after and browse snapshots saved from many years ago. And amazingly, the download links to the zip files still work. However, when I tried to run the main Python file, I started to get many errors. Google told me that some of these modules were no longer supported, so I went through the files and manually updated them to newer ones. But every time I fixed one problem, another one took its place. So I installed the older Python 2.7 on a laptop that had never had it, and sure enough, Skeen Forge opened without any issues and without any alterations. Here we are in Skyn Forge and it looks quite alien, but there are some similarities to modern slicing software. The first thing to note is that we have various profile types and it can actually handle CNC work, although I've never used it for that, only extrusion for 3D printing. We have our profile selection and a range of materials, and to edit any of those values, we need to come into our install directories and then open up that file and edit the contents within. All of our print settings are found in these different tabs. For instance, alteration, which handles start and NG code. We have the bottom for the first layer of the print, carve for things like layer height, chamber, if you had a heated bed, cause it wasn't that common back then. And then stuff like temperature, which as you might expect, sets the temperature of the hot end. Some things are quite obvious like skirt, but keep in mind that unless it's ticked, it won't be used. Fortunately, there are still some online manuals that you can get to thanks to the internet archive and they'll give you an overview of each section as well as what each of the parameters means. This Oozbang one is particularly interesting because if we look at this old wiki guide for Skeenchford from MakerBot, we can see that in 2009, there was a breakthrough where a traction was invented for the first time to prevent stringing. Many extruders weren't run by a stepper motor at that stage. So therefore this Oozbane works much like Coast where extrusion is shut off early to try and get rid of the extra plastic. The alteration section is looking for start and end.g code. And if we dig around inside the directory, we can see we have example templates to go from, including some slicer variables, which is pretty impressive at that stage. So I followed this and modified G code from my current slicer, including the variables taking my cues from the examples. So what if we actually want to slice something? To do that, we come up to craft, where we'll select the inbuilt test file for now. After a couple of seconds, we have our preview window pop up. The file's already completely sliced by this stage, and all we can do is toggle through the layers to see the preview. You'll note that there's not actually any 3D preview, and this was the best way we had to interpret the G-code. Uploading it to a modern G-code preview program shows that several of the M codes aren't matched and give errors, but we can still see the path that the tool head would take. This time, let's slice a 3D Benchy. After I select it, it seems like nothing is happening and perhaps something has crashed. But if we switch to the second window, we can see that in the background, things have started to happen. The only problem is they're happening very slowly. Now this is a 10 year old program, but running on a modern computer. So imagine how slow it was back in the day when it was running on a 10 year old computer as well. Four minutes in and the initial pass of the slice is done but it's still got to go through the same slices multiple times, one each for all of the procedures we ticked. And after eight minutes and 42 seconds, we finally have our sliced Benchy. Fortunately, the G code looks quite familiar, but how are its actual contents? It looks like my custom start G code worked quite well. But then after that, we have a section of existing start G code that I didn't think would be inserted. Beyond that, the resulting G code looks pretty normal, Although I do note it's counting the origin as the center of the bed instead of the lower left. 
If we analyze the G-code, we can see that there is in fact a 3D Benchy there, but it is riddled with G-code that our modern firmware just won't understand. And because of that, I'm not willing to risk printing it. Now remember back then that this would have been even slower thanks to the older computers. And if you had noticed there was a problem in the G-code, not only did you have to spot it in a layer by layer 2D view, you would make a change in the settings and then have to start the whole process again. Skinforge was an important step for 3D printing, but as soon as I could, I switched over to Slick3R embedded inside Repetier Host. Recreating these old aspects really brought back some memories for me and maybe some nightmares too, but I hope you found it interesting. Let me know in the comments what your favorite one of these was and maybe if you like what year you started 3D printing. Let's just hope that in another 10 years from now, we'll be looking back at current times and thinking once again, how far that we've come. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy historic 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.